we're really lucky to have Paula Montero with us today. She's a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. She's here, um, I have to look at the, the uh, little uh, abbreviations, FAP, ESP, and CALDO. It's a grant that she and I have managed to secure together. And uh, FAP, ESP is the Sao Paulo <laughs> Research Foundation in Brazil. And CALDO is the consortium of Alberta, Laval, Dalhousie, and Ottawa universities. And our project is called Religious Diversity in Brazil and Canada. And um, last year, I went to Brazil in January and realized that the, the religion and diversity project that I am the principal investigator for had no real mention or focus on Brazil at all. Um, and I realized after having been to Brazil that that might be a big mistake because there are lots of interesting things happening in Brazil and specifically around religion and religious diversity in Brazil. And so we started combing the world, looking for the best Brazilian researcher who's thinking about religious diversity. And uh, thanks to, actually to a do visiting doctoral student who was working with Peter Beyer, uh, found Paula. And she uh, very kindly agreed to participate in this collaboration. And so here she is today. So she's a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, she's president of the Brazilian Center of Analysis and Planning, which is known as CIBRA. Um, she's done her PhD in social and cultural, or cultural anthropology at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, she spent time at Columbia as a visiting scholar, um, the University of Chicago as a Tinker visiting professor, and since 1983 she's been interested in popular religions in Brazil. She's also worked on intercultural relations, multiculturalism, and she's also studying Christian missions <coughs> among Amazonian Indians. At present, she's focusing on new forms of religious organizations their acti and their activities in the modern public sphere. So without further ado, and being slightly late in starting, I'd like to thank you all for coming and ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Paula Montero. visit to Canada, so I'm very excited to know your country and uh, appreciate uh, all the trouble Laurie and her team had to bring me here. It's not uh, very easy to do this joint venture, so uh, I think uh, <laughs> we, we get started very well, so I'm very glad to be here. So I, I'm, I'm trying today to give you a general idea of what is religion and diversity in Brazil. I take a, 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 some historical approach in order to understand uh, how Brazil is today, nowadays, is depending on his uh, historical formation. So I will, grab, I will try to give here uh, a fast overview of the Brazilian religious field and to describe this uh, recent transformation because we are going into big transformations in the last two decades. A lot of things going on that are different. In one hand, we can uh, underline the decline of Catholic Church hegemony and the Pente Pentecostal Protestant advance. This is for me very important. On the other side, uh, we can say that the debate on secularism is becoming increasingly, increasingly important. That's a novelty also. In order, uh, uh, scholars have to deal with the paradoxical situation in which secularism is the political model of the state consensual accepted by all the social forces but at the same time religion is everywhere so we have this paradoxical situation 
when the state says, yes, we are a secular state, but we know religion is everywhere uh, in the political, in the public sphere, in political life. So th this paradox is challenging. Civil society testifies the increasingly significant religious presence in public debate, and at the same time, religious actors appropriate the secular discourse of science to attract new adverts. So religion, politics, science, everything is mingled, is entangled. So in order to understand what we can be called secularism in Brazil, I will try to examine with you the historical construction of Brazilian religious diversity and the construction of the public sphere. And I hope to be able to demonstrate that secularism and religions are closed linked and mutually, mutually reinforcing. Brazilian secularism is more than a century old. Nevertheless, the debate on secular secularity is increasingly acrimonious. Of course, as the international literature already knows, the juridical separation between church and state is far from being sufficient to bring to an end the conflict between religion and political governance. This separation was formally introduced in Brazil by the Republican Constitution in the 19th century. From that peri period on, religious conflict developed along two main lines. One of them, one was charted in the political field. It was the dispute between the two major existing bureaucratic forces, the state and the Catholic Church, to unravel their administration without losing control over civil life. Who will run cemeteries? Who will assist the poor? Who will give them education, etc.? That's one part of the conflict. The other was played in the religious field. From the monarchical period throughout the first republican regime, religious conflict opposed mainly Protestant and Catholic interests regarding the social and political privilege they could obtain from the state. Catholics fought to remain the state's religion and Protestants challenged shyly that position. So if we take this historical background into account, we can say that there was no genuine religious pluralism in the Brazilian society of the 19th century. This is a, a, a very important idea. Pluralism, it's a recent idea. And a recent phenomenon. It is impossible to assert the existence the existence of a religious field made up of many different religious systems in the newly born Brazilian society before the establishment of the Republican political system in 1989. In this sense, we can say that the religious pluralism legally preserved in contemporary Brazil is not a result of the historical regulation of the conflict between religions by the state, as it is the case, for instance, in France. On the contrary, it is possible to say that almost until the mid-20th century, it was commonly understood that popular magical practice were considered to be non-religious. They were barbarian customs not religions. For over 50 years, magical cures, African rituals, and static dances were considered only a threat to public morality and public order, as well as a practice that was dangerous to individual health. As such, they were prohibited and ill-treated. This controversial repression only came to an end when such practices were finally legally recognized as religious practice. In order to achieve that, they had to go through a long process 
in which they had to be able of producing a written doctrinal body and a liturgical cohesive system, elements necessary to the recognition of such practice as religion. You see that we have the Christian model behind it. Without a doctrinal body and without a cohesive system, you have no religion. You have only barbarian practices. In the same course of action, some magical forces manipulate for practical purpose were transformed into transcendent gods. Considering these characteristics of this long and complex historical process in Brazil, we can consequently assert that religious conflicts from the monarchical period throughout the First Republican regime oppose mainly Protestant and Catholic interests regarding the social and political privilege they could obtain from the state. As I said, Catholics fought to remain the state religion and Protestants challenged its position. In this sense, religious differences and values did not become an issue for the historical construction of Brazilian modernity as is, it was the case of Europe. In fact, as we are going to see in a quick panoramic overview, religious pluralism and secularism were constructed at once. Let's talk about a little bit of uh, religion, religious pluralism in Brazil. <coughs> Some of the most outstanding features of the Brazilian religious field are, one, its immense diversity of creeds. Two, its ongoing capacity to invent, to create new religions. And three, the widespread belief in God's existence among the major part of the population. Let me give you some ethnographical details of these three main characteristics in order to offer a general overview of the grounds upon which my main arguments are built. The spit Despite the still pervasive Catholic hegemony, the Brazilian religious field is traditionally perceived as being very heterogeneous. It is possible to name at least a dozen of different religious groups, and this number is still increasing. We create, the, every day we, we have a new religion going on. Although the majority of the population, 64% now, is still describes itself as Catholic, the last census in 2010 indicated the presence of 22% of Protestants, only 2% of Spiritists, and the less and less than 4% of Jews, Muslim, Hinduists. Buddhist, practitioner of African religions, Indian shamanism, and the other esoteric traditions. So, still, Christian is a Christian society, no? Protestant, Protestant and Catholic. Researchers agree that although atheism is still deeply stigmatized, <coughs> there is a general acceptance of this religious diversity today. Moreover, Individuals very often take part in many other rituals without necessarily abandoning the religion in which they were raised. They keep shifting among religions. It is also important to underline that except for Catholics and some Protestants, Jews and Muslims, most believers has, have adopted their new creeds in their adult life. They are not raised in these religions. Some of the existing religions in Brazil are typ typically homemade or remade and characterized by syncretism. Spiritism, for instance, it's an Allan Kardec French doctrine imported to Rio de Janeiro in the sen second half of the 19th century by French immigrants was widespread in a middle class milieu 
of physicians, lawyers, journalists, public officials, and free thinkers. 